Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this delayed survivorship lecture series by week. Um, uh, as last November was, uh, as we were saying, One Cancer Awareness Month, so appropriately timed uh, speakers today, um, a week after Thanksgiving, if you can believe it. <laughs> It's already a week ago. Um, so let me introduce our great speakers today. Um, Mirsal Munoz is a board certified nurse practitioner with a clinical background in preventative medicine. She received her bachelor's and master's of science in nursing at Loyola and has over 10 years of experience as a nurse before becoming the coordinator of the lung cancer screening program here at UI Health last November. Mary Pasquinelli, our other speaker, has got her doctorate in nursing practice at UIC after an over 35 year career in nursing. She's a nurse practitioner for pulmonary and medical oncology and the lung cancer service line and directs the lung cancer screening program. Mary has a special interest in racial disparities and health equity, which drives her, driving her to seek additional education and global health and frames much of her robust research and grant portfolio. Both Mary and Marisol are certified as tobacco treatment specialists through the program at Mayo Clinics. So I'm excited today. Someone's not muted, hold on. Muting Kate. Um, so I'm excited to have both of you speak today, this morning about lung cancer screening and tobacco cessation. So Mary, Marisol, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mance. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation here. All right, can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will get started. So today Marisol and I are going to speak on lung cancer and screening, health disparities and survivorship. And as Dr. Manstead said, November was Lung Cancer Awareness Month, but we hope that Lung Cancer Awareness Month and all cancer awareness happens throughout the year. So I have some grant uh, support, but no relevant conflict of interest for this presentation, either does Marisol Munez, uh, but I will be showing a proprietary slide regarding new technology that will be used at UI Health. The objectives of today are to review disparities in cancer mortality and lung cancer screening. I will describe in the eligibility criteria for lung cancer screening and discuss how a risk prediction model called the PLCO 2012 can significantly minimize race and gender or sex disparities in lung cancer screening. And then Marisol will discuss the UI Health Lung Cancer Screening Program and opportunities to overcome disparities. And then she'll discuss um, the evidence-based tobacco cessation therapy. So let's first talk about health disparities in Chicago. So these are maps showing cancer mortality rates among many of the common cancers in Chicago. Um, I, for reference, put where downtown Chicago and where our hospital is. And as you can see, um, the darker the color, the greater the cancer mortality. You can see that the south side of Chicago has greater cancer mortality than the north side of Chicago. These are maps of race, life expectancy, overall health status, and received needed care rates. The map on the left shows the race and ethnicity makeup of Chicago. Green represents Black or African American communities. Orange is Hispanic. Blue is the white populations. And red is the Asian communities. As you can see, as you probably know, that Chicago is very racially segregated. To the right of the, the race map is the life expectancy map. So the darker the color, the greater the life expectancy. Um, then we have the green map, which is the overall health status. The higher, the darker the green, the better the health status. And then the needed, received needed care status. The darker the color, the greater that the proportion of individuals living in those communities feel that they have received needed care. And there is a 17 year difference between life expectancy between those who live on the north side of Chicago and those that live on the south side of Chicago. 
And this brings us to the very important topic of social determinants of health, which are the conditions where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health and quality of life risks and outcomes. Conditions that include access to quality health care, education, employment opportunities, and neighborhood factors such as the quality of housing, belongingness to a community, access to healthy food, and neighborhood safety. You can see on these maps, the, the darker, the, the greater the rate, um, that the west and south side of Chicago has high poverty, unemployment, severe rent burden, and self-care difficulty rates, along with low levels of high school graduation, neighborhood safety, and community belonging rates. Social determinants of health are interconnected. Many of these factors influence the risk of cancer and health outcomes. These maps highlight that your zip code may be more indicative of your health than your genetic or DNA code. So the map on the left shows the adult smoking rates in Chicago, which mirror the lung cancer rates in Chicago shown to your right. Circled on uh, the map on the right is the, um, the, where the population or the catchment area where UI Health serves, along with the Miles Square Clinics. So the hospital is here as the H and the Miles Square Clinics are the red stars. And the Miles Square Clinics are strategically located in high need communities. UI Health has the opportunity to make a significant difference in lung cancer screening, early detection, and smoking cessation to improve health outcomes. So let's talk about smoking and lung cancer disparity. Who tends to smoke the most? As far as race goes, it's pretty much a lot American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest rate. But when you look at uh, the white African American and Hispanic uh, communities or population, they tend to smoke about the same. When we look at education, the lower the education status, the higher the smoking rates. And when we look at poverty, those who live below the poverty line have a 26% smoking rate, and those above the poverty line is 14%. Cigarette advertising is targeted at minority and low-income communities. And minorities are least likely to be screened for smoking by primary care providers and receive smoking cessation resources. We are all going to change that in UI Health. When we look at lung cancer, who is the highest risk for lung cancer? African Americans, particularly African American men, have the highest incidence and mortality of lung cancer. African Americans tend to smoke fewer cigarettes a day, but longer in years. They're more likely to smoke menthol, which is targeted at African American populations, and menthol cigarettes are more addictive and much harder to quit. And they're more likely to be diagnosed at a late stage. Women have a higher risk of lung cancer, even though they tend to smoke fewer cigarettes per day or have less smoking intensity compared to men who smoke. So um, the annual report to the nation on the cancer of status was released in July of this year. And what they found is cancer mortality rates are going down, which is great. But the declines in death rates were accelerated for lung cancer. And that is wonderful news because we know that decreasing mortality rates increase survivorship rates. And that is great. So why is this so important? It's because lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death for both men and women in the United States and globally. So the report says that the declines in the death rates were accelerated for lung cancer due to three factors, lung cancer screening, decrease in smoking, and treatment. And I would like to discuss each of these through the lens of health equity and highlight some of the work that we have published. So first, let's talk about lung cancer screening. So here's the lung cancer screening timeline of kind of big events. Over to the left in 1999, the Early Cancer Action, um, Early Lung Cancer Action Project was published in Lancet. 
it screened a thousand individuals age over 60 that have had at least a 10 pack year history of smoking. They screened them with a chest x-ray and a chest CT for three years. And they found that the chest CT was more likely to detect small lung nodules. That led to the National Lung Screening Trial, which was published in 2011, that showed that there is a decrease uh, by 20% in lung cancer mortality of those screened uh, by use of low dose CT. In 2013, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, the USPSTF, recommend lung cancer screening age 50, 55 to 80 with a 30 pack year history of smoking and those who are currently smoking or who've quit in the last 15 years. And those recommendations that that eligibility criteria was very similar to the national lung screening trial and that's why they chose that eligibility um, criteria. In 2015, CMS recommended lung cancer screening, similar age, but the uh, upper age limit went to 77. So 55 to 77, 30 pack years, um, 15 year quit time, but they also mandated that a shared decision-making visit was done. Uh, the same month that uh, CMS came out with their recommendations, we relaunched the UI Health Lung Cancer Screening Program. Previously, UI Health had a program to screen patients high risk for lung cancer for $99. Um, this program had very high uh, enrollment in more affluent communities and affluent hospital systems, but uh, here at UI Health, the uptake was very low because $99 was a cost barrier to most of our uh, patients that we serve. And with the USPSTF and CMS, the cost bearer barrier is removed. If we use their recommendations, um, it's paid for by insurance without any co-pays or cost sharing. So um, that allows everybody, no matter what their financial status is, to be able to get screened. Uh, the Nelson trial was published in, um, or the results were released in 2018. It's the uh, Dutch-Belgium trial, similar to the National Lung Screening trial. And it found that there was a greater than 26% lung cancer mortality reduction. At the beginning of this year, in the spring, the USPSTF modified their screening eligibility criteria. They found that they knew that there was some disparities there. So they decreased it to age 50, decreased the pack years to 20, and kept the quit years at 15. CMS just a few weeks ago also modified their screening eligibility criteria. Starting at the age of 50, they kept 77 as the higher age limit. Uh, they decreased their pack years to 20, kept the 15-year quit time, and kept the shared decision-making visit. Lung cancer screening is endorsed by many large societies, such as the American Cancer Society, the American Lung Association, NCCN, CHEST, ATS, and now it's also um, endorsed by the American Academy of Family Physicians. I wanna talk a little bit more about the National Lung Screening Trial because that's ba the basis of some of the research that we've been doing at UI Health. So the National Lung Screening Trial is the largest randomized controlled trial in lung cancer screening to date. Over 53,000 individuals at 33 centers across the United States um, were in the trial. Uh, the inclusion criteria were ages 55 to 74, individuals who are currently smoking or were quit in the last 15 years with a 30 pack year history of smoking. And 30 pack years is equivalent to smoking one pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years or any of those equivalents. They randomize individuals into two groups uh, to receive either a chest X-ray or a low dose CT and did three annual screens. They found a 20% decrease in lung cancer deaths for those who received a low dose CT versus chest X-ray, and their lung cancer detection rate was 1.1%. But the population screened was 91% white and only 4.5% African Americans. And as I said before, African Americans have the highest incidence and mortality from lung cancer. So what we did at the beginning of our lung cancer screening, we knew that our population was very different from the national lung screening trial that the, the guidelines are based off of. And we wanted to study that. So we looked at our first 500 patients screened and we compared them to the national lung screening trial. And our work was published in JAMA Oncology in 2018. And the title of the publication was called 
outcomes from a minority-based lung cancer screening program versus the national lung screening trial. When we look at race, our population of the first 500 patients screened at UI Health was 70% 70, 70 African-American individuals versus 4.5% of uh, the national lung screening trial. When you look at smoking status, Sadly, our current smoking rate was 73% in our population. This is some of the highest smoking rates across the, in the United States and uh, screening programs that I have heard of. It's significantly higher than um, many other ones. And the smoking rate in uh, the National Lung Screening Trial was 48%, which is more typical. Those diagnosed with lung cancer, our rate was 2.6% twice as high as the National Lung Screening Trial. Both cohorts, our cohort and the National Lung Screening Trial, diagnosed over 50% of the cases were diagnosed at an early stage or a stage one curable disease, uh, curable stage. So then we noticed some disparities. Through lung cancer screening and then seeing the patients through the continuum care of pulmonary nodule management and lung cancer at the lung cancer clinic, we noticed that a significant number of patients in the pulmonary nodule clinic with high risk lung nodules and those diagnosed with lung cancer would not have met screening eligibility if screened you in the, using the USPS TF eligibility criteria. And it appeared that fewer African Americans would have met that criteria due to they tend to smoke fewer cigarettes a day compared to white individuals and they wouldn't have met the 30 pack year history of smoking. So then we were thinking, should lung cancer criteria be based only on age and smoking history? Currently, public policy of CMS and USPSTF only um, have their eligibility, price, uh, eligibility criteria based off of age and smoking history. But, but we know that there's more other variables that increase an individual's risk for lung cancer, such as a diagnosis of COPD, a family history of lung cancer, a personal history of other cancers, and then I talked already stated that race and gender increases a person's risk of cancer. Whoop. And then we have the social determinants of health that also may increase a person's risk and outcomes of cancer. So now I'd like to introduce you to um, the work that we have done called the study called the Chicago Race Eligibility for Screening Cohort, also known as the CREST study. The research design was the screening for lung cancer using the USPSTF eligibility criteria have a race and ethnicity disparity. And if so, can the PLCO M2012 risk prediction model eliminate or significantly minimize this disparity? The design was a retrospective study of lung cancer cases with the smoking history here at UI Health from 2010 to 2019, and 883 individuals or cases met that criteria. The aim was to compare the USPSTF criteria to the PLCO risk prediction model for sensitivity and the ability to remove disparities in lung cancer screening. For those of you who do not know about the PLCO risk prediction model, it is a, um, a calculator that, that calculates the six-year risk of lung cancer uh, in the screening cohort. Canada is using it for screening criteria and the United Kingdom is using it, um, but it has never been used to look at disparities or eliminating disparities. It has 11 variables. It includes age, smoking status if they are currently or former, uh, formerly smoked, Cur um, smoking duration, how many cigarettes per day by, by how many years, their quit years, how long ago did they quit. And then it also includes race, if they have a history of COPD or emphysema, a family history of, of uh, lung cancer, a personal history of other cancers, the highest level of education obtained, which is a proxy for social determinants of health or socioeconomic status, and their BMI. The PLCO risk prediction model does not have an age, smoking pack year, or quick time limit. Uh, this is what the, um, the calculator kind of looks like. You can download it uh, on the web for free, and you just put in the variables, and then it gives you a risk prediction. 
uh, percent for a six-year risk. It also is on a, a phone app now for iPhones and Androids in English and Spanish, so you can download it. It's very uh, user, patient, and provider friendly. And to kind of show you how it works, I put up the, there's the 1.7 six-year risk prediction or risk, um, uh, six-year risk is equivalent to what the USPSTF would screen for and using the former 2013 criteria. So if you have an individual who is 60, who is white, who formerly smoked and quit 10 years ago, but they meet that 30-year pack year, so they meet age and pack year, but they don't meet it, they don't have any other additional risk factors, no COPD or family history of lung cancer. Their six-year risk of lung cancer is fairly low, it's 1%. But if you have an individual who is African American, age 50, who currently smokes a 20-pack year history, but also has a history of COPD, that risk jumps up to 1.7%. And then if you add lung cancer, uh, family history of lung cancer, it really increases to a, a risk of 3.2%. So now I want to talk about some of our published research. Um, our first um, research was, our publication was published in the a Journal of Thoracic Oncology uh, last year. And we looked at comparing the USPSTF former criteria, the 2013 criteria, to the PLCO risk prediction model. And before I talk about the results, I want to highlight some of our population characteristics. So out of the 883 cases, 56% were African American and 29% were white. And if you look at the smoking history, only 61% of the African American cohort would meet the 30-year pack year cutoff versus 81% of the white cohort. African Americans tend to be uh, lighter smokers. But when you look at the current versus current versus former, the majority or 65% of this cohort when they were diagnosed with lung cancer had a current smoking history versus 15, 57% of the white cohort. So they tended to smoke fewer pack years, but they continue to smoke longer in years. When we look at the results, um, we see this is a sensitivity table. We see that the USPSTF, this is uh, the white cohort and African-American cohort, would only have selected 50% of the um, African-American cohort and 62% of the white cohort. But when you look at the PLCO risk prediction model at a 1.7 rate, it has significantly increased in sensitivity in identifying African-Americans selecting 71% um, uh, of the African-American cohort, which is an increase of 21% in sensitivity in relative terms. This is a 42% increase in sensitivity for the PLCO risk prediction model in African-Americans. Then at the beginning of this year, the USPSTF changed their guidelines, decreasing age to 50, decreasing pack year history to, to 20. And we wanted to see, that, is there still a race disparity in the new guidelines? So we did a reanalysis. This time we used a 1% cutoff because this is the threshold that would have identified the same amount of the similar number of eligible individuals for the USPSTF 2021 criteria. This work was uh, published in December of last year called Brief Report, Risk Prediction Model versus the USPSTF 20, this is 2021 criteria at the time it was just in a draft form. And it was published in the um, Journal of Thoracic Oncology um, Clinical Research Reports. And when we stratified this by race. The new guidelines were much better in identifying African-American individuals high risk, but still under-selected for them. But when you look at the PLCO risk prediction model, you see that it was much more sensitive, um, selecting many more um, African-Americans and including the, the white cohort. And this is statistically significant. Um, you can see that by using looking at the odds ratio and the statistically significant p-value. 
When we look at individuals that would have not met the screening criteria due to not meeting eligibility by pack year, quit time, or age over 50, you can see here, this is stratified um, by um, race again, and those who did not meet the 20 year pack year limit were more likely in the parentheses as what percent wouldn't have met that. 10% of the white cohort would not have met the 20 year pack year pack year cutoff, but in African Americans, it's almost double that, 19% wouldn't have met that. In the brackets below is the percent that would have met eligibility by using the PLCO risk prediction model. Quit time and um, age under 50 did not have a race disparity between um, African American and white individuals, but a significant amount of those that would have not met these um, criteria would have been met the eligibility criteria using the PLCO risk prediction model. So let's move on to gender and sex disparities and lung cancer screening. As I said, um, the um, uh, women are more like, are at a higher risk for lung cancer, even though they tend to smoke fewer cigarettes per day compared to men who smoke. Uh, this research was recently published in CHEST titled Addressing Sex Disparities and Lung Cancer Screening Eligibility Criteria. When we look at the demographic stratified by sex, here's females in this row or column and males in this column, you can see that women were, had a lower pack year smoking history compared to men and they, uh, they tend to be lighter smokers. And this has a very statistically significant p-value. This slide shows the gender disparity and sensitivity for selection criteria using USPSTF and the PLCO risk prediction model. And here in the red bars, this is looking at the, the former USPSTF criteria. Um, the women, the females are in green and males are in blue. And you can see that they're uh, the uh, old criteria of USPSTF under select for women. But even when we go to the new criteria, the new um, 50, age 50 and 20 pack years, it's still under selects for women. So there's still a gender disparity in the new guidelines, and that is shown by the statistically significant p-value. But when you compare it to the PLCO risk prediction model at 1.7 and at 1%, it equally selects for both men and women and that is shown by the non-statistically significant p-value. So in conclusion for our CHESS study, we found that the USPSTF 2021 criteria still shows a race and gender disparity. Uh, use of the PLCO risk prediction model at a 1% risk threshold appears to eliminate race disparities and minimize gender disparities. And we recommend using the PLCO risk prediction model along with the USPSTF lung cancer screening guidelines. So if they don't meet um, USPSTF, they should be screened by PLCO and then get screened if they meet, if they're over 1%. The American Thoracic Society statement came out last year saying that a inclusion of a risk prediction model into the USPSTF guidelines for high risk, high risk, uh, high risk, high benefit individuals should be done. Although unfortunately the USPSTF and CMS did not include a risk prediction model. Um, we are continue to add to the evidence of research saying there are race disparities and risk prediction models are important to use. Our work has been cited by um, many other people, but I just kind of wanted to highlight this editorial. I was pleased to see that our work was highlighted by Paula Jacobs and Dr. Springfield from the NCI. Dr. Springfield is the director of the NCI Center for to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities. And they, they highlighted and kind of talked about our research. Um, they support the use of using a risk-based model along with culturally appropriate education and outreach to reduce screening disparities. And that's exactly what we're doing at UI Health. So let's move on to tobacco use and smoking cessation. This is that second factor that really drove um, lung cancer mortality down and increased survivorship. The good news is smoking trends over the years have gone down. Uh, the blue lines represent females, the black line is males, 
and the solid line are people who currently smoke has decreased over time as those who formerly smoked have gone up. That's the good news. But unfortunately, many communities um, and particularly minorities and those with uh, mental health issues, those who are marginalized communities, LGBTQ communities, continue to have a very high smoking rate. Um, UI Health, this is the population that currently smokes, and this is an epic if the smoking history is in there, which we will talk about soon. Um, this is an epic that over the age of 18, there are over 18,000 individuals that currently smoke within our hospital system. And I see that as 18,000 opportunities to help our patients quit smoking in order to improve health outcomes and decrease tobacco related disease. But we really need to address the elephant in the room when we talk about lung cancer and smoking, and that is the issue of stigma. Stigma, explicit bias, and implicit bias adds to health disparities. Current evidence suggests that stigma detrimentally affects psychosocial communication and behavior outcomes over the entire lung cancer control continuum and across multiple levels. For many patients who are high risk for lung cancer, those in the screening cohort or those who smoke or have received a diagnosis of lung cancer, the stigma can detrimentally affect their willingness to engage in screening for early detection, delay seeking medical evaluation for presenting symptoms and limit their involvement, not only in lung cancer treatment, but also in survivorship care. Now, pictures are worth a thousand words. And I did a quick internet ser ser uh, search and I just put in people with breast cancer and people with lung cancer. And these are the images that I, I came up with. You can see the images on the left, those with breast cancer shows togetherness, support, lots of pink, survivorship, uh, pictures of hope as well known uh, as and also well-known celebrity breast cancer advocates. Those, the image on the left show picture of lung cancer, shows images of diseased lungs, people alone, some people suffering such as those on oxygen, those alone, dying alone. And it is really kind of unfortunate when you search for this because you can see the stigma. In fact, when people, um, people have told me those with breast cancer, when they disclose to friends or others that they have breast cancer, often the first thing that is said, said to them is, I am so sorry, what can I do to help? But when people often disclose their lung cancer diagnosed to others, often the first thing that they say are, did you smoke or do, well, you smoke. And that's increasing that blame and stigma to a patient. Now, um, equity starts with our words and the International Association for, uh, for the Study of Lung Cancer recognized that stigmatizing language can affect care provided to patients, impact attitudes or other, uh, from other healthcare providers towards the patient and can adversely impact health outcomes. To align with their goals, they re to reduce the burden on lung cancer on patients and family, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer published a, uh, a language guide to decrease stigma. On the right, I have three easy, simple things that we can all do to decrease uh, disparities because equity starts with our words. First, always use person-first language when you talk to our patients. Don't say lung cancer patient. It's a patient with lung cancer. Eliminate blame language. Don't say patients failed the treatment. The treatment failed the patient. And in stigma, try to avoid using stigmatizing negative terms such as smoker. Instead, use a person who smokes. And it's very important that we do this not only with our patients, but also with our um, our other colleagues in the clinic when we're presenting cases and also in our notes because our patients can see that note, the, the notes. Uh, last year, I was asked to do a podcast called Lung Cancer Considered. Um, uh, it's called um, Changing the Conversation, Overcoming Stigma and Language 
through language and action. This was done by a very well-known um, uh, doctor, a PhD, who studies stigma and lung cancer, along with two very well-known um, cancer survivors. And if you'd like to go listen to that, um, it's on SoundCloud. So then let's move to um, the third uh, factor that decreased uh, lung cancer mortality and increased survivors. And that is through the new advancements. Um, so first I wanna talk about, um, even though lung cancer mortality rates have gone down, there's been reports that this decline has been uh, less robust in the African-American population. Uh, they said that African-Americans have a, a less likely to receive surgery for curative intent and to receive uh, appropriate therapies. And I wanna highlight what we're doing at UI Health to prevent these disparities. When we look at immunotherapy and targeted therapy, this is, these therapies have really changed uh, treatment outcomes. But so we are biomarker or testing molecular um, to all of the patient's tumors who have non-small cell lung cancer get biomarker or NGS testing and pdl one testing, everybody. Um, and then targeted therapy and immunotherapy is providing as as indicated, we have the data on all the biomarkers or mutations that our patients have. So as new therapies come out, we can easily recognize who has that mutation so we can reach out to them to see if they would meet eligibility for a new treatment. We also have looking at uh, robotic surgery and radio radiotherapy. Um, we have VATS, which is video assisted um, lung surgery, and we also have the robotics surgery, which is great. But if those who did not meet surgery eligibility because maybe multiple comorbidities or their lung functions aren't very good, or they refuse uh, surgery, we can offer them SBRT, which is precise radiation therapy. And then we have the new kit on the block, which will be at our hospital, hopefully by the beginning of next year, called robotic navigational bronchoscopy. I just kind of want to mention about that. So the goal of lung cancer screening or the goal of to decrease mortality is to diagnose lung cancer as early as possible, such as a small nodule. And this is that nodule on PET. Uh, on PET. We want to be able to diagnose it when it's very small. But in order to do that, we um, sometimes bronchoscopy can't get to these outer lesions. And if you do a transthoracic needle biopsy, Often you can't get small nodules or because of a severe emphysema, the patient is not a candidate for that, or it might be in a location that it's hard to get. We wanna be able to diagnose biopsy these before they metastasize, like this has metastasized to the lymph nodes. So we have uh, ion robotic navigational bronchoscopy, which we can use which is a bronchoscopy, uh, a bronchoscope that can go down to very peripheral lo um, located lesions and actually even small lesions down to even a little bit less than one centimeter. So this is going to be able to really change diagnosing lung cancer early. And we're really excited for that technology. So now I'm going to have Marisol Munez talk about our lung cancer screening program. Marisol, take it away. Mary? Our UI Health Lung Screening Program services the Chicagoland area with our identified disparities. Our current screening guidelines include those of the United States Preventative Task Force. And it may be on my dresser, but other than that, I don't know. And has updated, which has updated their guidelines to a lower pack year history, decrease age, however, quit time remaining the same. In November of this year, CMS has also adapted the new guidelines. Currently in our program, we have over 1,200 participants. Our population screened is 70% African-American, 19% white, and 11% Hispanic. 70% of those in the program currently smoke. Our current Cancer detection rate is at 2.6%, which is above our national average, and over 65% of our cancer detected is at an early stage on a baseline scan, stage one or two. At UI Health, our lung 
In our lung screening program, we utilize a comprehensive model in which we collaborate across our healthcare system to ensure quality care for our patients. When a patient is referred to our lung screening program, a shared decision-making visit is conducted and documented as mandated by Medicare. A lung cancer risk assessment is performed. In-depth smoking cessation counseling is provided by our certified tobacco treatment specialist. Patients have the opportunity to review their scan with the provider and use this as a teachable moment in the patient's care. We continue to keep patients connected to screening by scheduling their annual follow-up and connecting them to other resources if needed. We maintain close communication with their primary care providers in regards to lung screening. This is our current low-dose CT order, which includes the United States Preventative Task Force guidelines and reviews eligibility for screening. The lung screening workflow is started when a patient is identified, possibly meeting criteria. The patient then has our shared decision-making visit. The screen is done and categorized by our lung rads criteria. Based on a patient's lung rads, appropriate follow-up will be performed. And if they meet lung rads criteria for, a workup will be initiated and patients will be presented at our multidisciplinary tumor board and final recommendations are discussed. So some of the things that I wanted to highlight about shared decision-making is, again, we review the, the age criteria, our smoking status, Pack your history and ensure the patient is asymptomatic of lung cancer. The impact of comorbidities and ability to undergo diagnosis and treatment. Counseling on the importance of adherence to an annual lung cancer low-dose CT screen. And of course, counseling on smoking cessation. And of course, during the visit, we ensure that all this is documented to be included under the shared decision-making visit. Our tobacco cessation counseling uh, is done in pretty much in three steps. First, we would assess for the readiness at every visit. We attempt to set a quit date with our patients and assess for any barriers to quit and offer support. Tobacco cessation at any stage is always a benefit to the patient. It would help improve outcomes of treatment and prevent reoccurrence of primary cancers. Other topics that are discussed during a tobacco cessation visit are benefits of, of the tobacco cessation. We include health benefits starting from minutes of quitting smoking through hours, days, months, and years. We also discuss the benefits to other health factors within the patient's care and also stress the importance of qu how quitting smoking can lower the risk of 12 different types of cancer. And lastly, during tobacco cessation therapy, we discuss combination pharma pharmacological therapy, such as nicotine replacement with patches or short acting nicotine replacement, or also medications like verinicline or bupropion. In addition, we attempt to encourage behavioral therapy, such as one-on-one -on -one counseling, group therapy, or even brief counseling that can, that can occur during any patient encounter. Using these in combination have been, have been shown to have success for the patient in their tobacco cessation needs. Currently at UI Health, we continue to have patients over the age of 50 meeting lung screening criteria that are current smokers. From EPIC, we've been able to identify at least 9,000 patients that are current smokers over the age of 50. One of the key factors in identifying patients that may qualify for lung screening is entering the smoking history into EPIC. We need to ensure that the correct pack years are entered in order for patients to be identified and have a health maintenance topic triggered for the patient. Our lung screening volumes continue to increase and continuous outreach is done to ensure patients in the, in the program continue to screen. During COVID, screening was stopped, but has picked up very nicely in the last few months and continues to increase. 
there continue to be barriers in lung screening. For one, the different eligibility criteria with the United States Preventative Task Force and Medicare guidelines, such as the age being from 77 versus 80, low return rates in annual screening, the shared decision-making visit not being completed or documented, patients not receiving low-dose CT results or follow-up, and smoking cessation not being integrated. We are eliminating these barriers through our comprehensive lung screening program to, to overcome any of, the patient, any of the patient needs. In addition, we continue to establish partnerships with our lung screening patients um, across the continuum of, in Chicago. We have many partners that have identified patients and often refer to us. And I want to thank you for your participation. Wow, thank you, you guys, um, Mary and Marisol. That was a wonderful presentation that really was very comprehensive about uh, giving us a primer for about the racial disparities um, and about disparities in healthcare and lung cancer. Um, and we need to start using the PLCO tool in survivorship clinic. Okay, we will. Uh, I'm going to start integrating that so that we're using that calculator and all of our patients that don't meet but uh, do have family histories and things like that because that's so important. Um, and also that language guide is incredible. I've been saying for a while now, you know, it's patients with something, cancer or diabetes, obesity. It's a, these patients are not defined by their disease. And it's, you know, giving credit to that is, is important and helps to frame discussions with the patients. So um, and thanks Marisol for explaining the lung cancer screening program. So um, I know it's something that we want to get into and are going to start discussing further how we can help with the Cancer Supportive Services Council to advance that entering smoking history more correctly so we can enhance all these initiatives and enhance our programming around that. So that's really good. Do you guys use um, and refer to the Illinois Tobacco Quit Line as well? We do. We definitely do. Um, sometimes patients, uh, whether they just want to find their own methods of the quit, the quit line and explore other options, we definitely give them that resource. Great. Yeah, the quit line, I give them the opportunity uh, to uh, give them the information. I have it kind of on a card and mm -hmm. I use it to augment things. So if they're really having a bad day and they want to reach out to somebody right away, they can reach out to the quit line. So uh, the more support and resources we give them, uh, the more tools, the more successful they will be. Yeah, yeah, multimodal attack on <laughs> smoking cessation is the best method. So being able to offer all the different services. Wow. And I yeah. I, I just saw the chat that there's some questions. Um, yeah, I was going to open it up and bring up all these questions. Uh, great questions that are being asked by everyone. Lots of interest in what you guys are doing. So uh, Dr. Ganshaw, um, I'm not sure if she was able to stay on, but she was wondering if you know if any research looked at the number of times a day smoked instead of the number of cigarettes per, or packs per day. Um, to consider for relighting cigarettes, because we know that increases the ingestion of chemicals and uh, carcinogens. Right. So she wondered if that, that is part of what accounts for the increased risk with the lower pack year for African Americans. Mm -hmm. So I don't know of any research about that, but we know that that is not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, many of our patients, because they believe that it's a, a benefit to only, if they're only trying to cut down, they will only smoke a quarter or a half and then just smoke that more and more throughout the day, which is not a good thing. So I discussed that with them. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, and there hasn't been a whole lot of research about this, but I'm hoping we can do it. I have a, a team of researchers that are looking at different things in lung cancer, lung cancer screening. Um, but I really feel that it's probably 
uh, smoking cigarettes per day, even if it's not smoking a pack a day, let's smoke, you know, eight cigarettes a day or whatever. If you continue to smoke every day for many, many, many years, your lungs are never healing up. It's never giving that time to decrease that inflammation. And when you constantly are keeping your lungs inflamed or, you know, this whole um, inflammatory network from smoking or irritants, I think that probably increases a person's risk. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, Hopefully we'll be able to answer that in the future. Yeah, I know when I'm talking to patients about smoking and strategies for starting to quit down, I I often ask about relighting. And it's the number one thing that patients are like, oh, oh my God, I'm going to stop doing that right now because that freaks them out like more than anything. (laughs) It seems money thing. They don't want to pay for cigarettes. That's a financial barrier. So they will have a few cigarettes, but they will use them differently than if you smoke a whole cigarette and then you're done with that cigarette. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. What's next here is, uh, let's see. Dr. El Kameni said great presentation in regards to pack your guidelines and calculators. How's the use of hookahs and vaping calculated under the pack guidelines? Is that included? And how do our smoking cessation programs compare to the increasing cost of smoking in terms of impact of economics on our patient population? Yeah. So on uh, the calculator, they don't look at other forms of smoking like the hookah and the vaping. In EPIC, there are separate, um, they have the smoking cigarettes and then other products, e-cigarettes, you can put hookah in there. So we are capturing that information. Hookah is incredibly bad for your lungs. So any patient, I ask all of my patients, not just smoking cigarettes, but um, tobacco use, uh, non-smokable or like chewable tobacco, nicotine products, um, vaping, hookah, I ask all of them. And also what kind of brand of cigarettes? Some patients smoke this black and mild, these many cigars, that one cigar is equal to 10 cigarettes. So they think I only smoke two cigars a day um, or too many cigarettes, but actually that is increasing the risk of lung cancer. So I talked to them a a lot about that. And looking at the economic costs, so the Surgeon General warning came out um, 50 years ago, and um, that was at the peak of smoking in the country. And then we've had a bunch of policies that have decreased smoking rates you know, no more advertising, changing advertising on cigarettes and increasing the cost of cigarettes and increasing the ta- tax all and the no smoking inside uh, policies. All of that has helped push drive smoking cessation down or not letting people start smoking, which is great. But um, the impact if you're addicted to cigarettes and addicted to nicotine, it is a very hard thing to quit. And patients will continue to smoke. I mean, look at the people and, and under the poverty level that are continuing to smoke. It is an addiction. And when we look at it as an addiction, it is much more likely for our patients and in a non-judgmental way to really get some help on smoking cessation. Yeah, so right, so right. Dr. Jabin had a couple of questions. Uh, will we be collecting the data on effects of the PLCO screening modality on mortality, not just uh, identification rates? Yeah. So right now, we cannot screen using the PLCO risk prediction model because if they don't meet criteria, USPSTF and CMS, we can't screen for them. Marisol and I kind of have our ways of trying to work around that. Um, it is covered under the NCCN guidelines also um, decreasing, um, you know, to use a risk prediction model. So we try to work around that as much as possible, but we are following all of our patients with um, lung cancer and um, in our lung cancer screening program along throughout the years, looking at mortality benefit. Great, Great. question. Yeah. And that's my chart question because that's yeah. exactly what Marisol and I are working at. First of all, smoking status needs to be in there, particularly pack years, in order for a BPA to be triggered to tell the provider, the primary care doctor, to know that this patient would meet eligibility. And if it's not in there, that's not going to happen. But Marisol and I are working 
We have a video that we worked with with the GoTo Foundation that we're going to co-brand with UI Health. And we're going to send information through my chart of all the patients that are high risk just to tell them about um, lung cancer screening. It's just a, like a three minute video. Um, and then if they want to be screened, that they, they should talk to their primary care doctor about eligibility, or they can also reach out to us. Great. Great. Yeah. My, my chart has been a wonderful tool in contacting patients and getting them reconnected to care. It's been amazing to reach out to them via my mm -hmm. chart. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. We're finding some great use with that too. Um, so let's see, uh, Jessica Itner, um, pediatric cancer survivorship APRN. She and Christian, um, the latest COG guidelines recommend low dose CT for childhood cancer survivors who had lung radiation and are high risk. We interpret this as patients who have radiation to the chest and smoke. Any research going on with that that they maybe haven't seen or any thoughts about that? Jessica was a um she and I went to through our nurse practitioner training together. So hello, Jessica, <laughs> and I love the work that you're doing. Uh, so people with um, radiation to their lungs and smoking and also people with asbestos are at high risk. There, it does fit into a category that they should be screened. Um, I don't know for the young adults exactly what those guidelines are. I know asbestos can be screened for low dose CT. And um, I would, you know, low dose CT has very minimal radiation levels, and I would highly recommending that. Um, if you want to do that with any of your patients, reach out to Marisol and I. We would want to do it under a different low dose CT order instead of a screening order because it's not really a screening order, um, and that will it would be denied from radiology that they don't meet criteria. So if you're interested in doing that, we can work up a system to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. So Leslie, or Jessica and Mary get in touch because um, that sounds like a good uh, quality improvement that we can do to offer more patients services. Um, another from Dr. Jabine, really important work and truly applicable to our population. What is the resistance to USP, SDF, and CMS uptake to this prediction model? And how can we advocate to change this? Yeah, so there's a couple different risk prediction models and the USPST, when you, I read their like 100 page uh, report on why they chose different things. Um, they're saying a couple things. They're, first of all, they're saying that um, Unfortunately, when they looked at risk prediction models, because it's really hard to look at the other factors between age and smoking history, they took a lot of that information out, though that data points. So it looks like you're just really screening older individuals. Um, so that data was kind of skewed a little bit um, because and they did a simulation model and they didn't have if the patient has a family history or if they have COPD, they really kind of looked at the risk prediction model only looking at age and and smoking history. So that was unfortunate. They did that for the other models too. So it looked like you're just increasing screening for those who are older who have a lot of comorbidities. And that's unfortunate. But the big thing is that they feel that lung cancer screening uptake across the United States has been very low. And it's hard enough. The hardest thing really to, is to do the pack your history of smoking accurately, because we know that that changes over time. But they felt if they did a risk prediction model, it's going to add a barrier to primary care doctors. Now just age and race, um, like it's easy with women with breast cancer screening. It's age and you know if they're female or if they're high risk, then it falls into another criteria. Or um, for uh, normal risk people for colonoscopy, it's age pretty much. It's pretty easy to do. But when you have to pull in all these factors, they feel like it would increase a barrier to get people screened. And there's already a lot of barriers. But just like when you, you're screening a patient for car, the 10-year cardiac risk, um, there's a whole bunch of information that you pull, it, pull in. Your, you know, their height and their weight and their, their blood pressure and their cholesterol level to see if they should be on a statin or an aspirin. And those are risk prediction models. But for some reason, they feel like this is more cumbersome. 
but the University of Michigan is working with an EPIC system. They have a grant and we're hoping to use this too, where through EPIC, it can pull all those variables in. Um, so, and then you can see the risk prediction model, uh, risk prediction score for all of our patients in the future. And maybe they don't have education in there, or maybe they don't have, um, if they have a family history of lung cancer, you can easily add it to be sure. So we're hoping to streamline that in order to improve efficiency with that. And there's now a lot of uh, buzz and, and, um, and publications around risk prediction models. So I'm hoping even though USPSTF and CMS said no at this point, um, they still know that there may be a disparity in their new guidelines and they continue to meet. So we're hoping that in the future they will uh, use the risk prediction model. Yeah, the USPSDF, I, I actually worked there as a, on a rotation <laughs> of during my preventive medicine residency. And uh, they were starting to really pay attention to being sensitive with their language and more inclusive about gender there. So, and I know racial disparities is something else that is another item of inclusion that the USPSTF is starting to think about more. So yeah, I hope that those changes we'll see. Great. And yeah, you're, you're speaking about the primary care providers, you know, and their limited time. And Dr. Jemine also said that my chart, bringing back to my chart, that access might be really helpful for overcoming that time factor for those PCPs who are really pressed for time. And with the PCPs being pressed for time, if you want to order your own screen, follow them and have to fill out all that data, you can do that. It is time consuming or one click and then you can just refer them to our comprehensive screening program. We will do everything. And then we see them either in person or by telehealth. And I see there's a telehealth and then we'll continue to follow them by smoking cessation. I'm taking over your, yeah. your question. <laughs> okay. that one. Yes, definitely refer on to our program. Um, some of our patients do come into the office and they just prefer it to be mm -hmm. that way, but we do offer telehealth as well. And I know also with our uh, PharmD program that they offer both as well in office and, and telehealth. Yeah, I wanted to highlight that. Uh, Lori Wilkin is on our call. Maybe she can speak a little bit about the, uh, the program that you run and the collaborations between you two. She has been my mentor. Lori. <laughs> Hi, everybody. No, we work great together. And there's so many smoker, you know, people who smoke, I should say, yeah, that we need all the help um, we can get. So it's teamwork, definitely. And um, uh, I think that with all of us working together and including the screening and the history, it's really going to uh, make our patients' health better. So great yeah. presentation. This was amazing. Thank you for all your hard work, Mary and Marisol. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And coming back to that again, you were talking about telehealth, Mary. Uh, again, Dr. Chipine said that I know there are plans to reduce remote telehealth, but are we offering remote cessation counseling? Marisol. Again, we are trying to um, incorporate it into our Mile Square clinics, and hopefully we can eventually reach those satellite locations as well. Um, in addition, we'll continue on with our telehealth for now. All right. And then one more from Dr. Chapin. Are there any predictors for exposure to secondhand smoke? Is that so figured in the model? It is not feared in the model, but we know that, that that increases a person's risk for lung cancer. Um, there, and it's really hard to really quantify the amount of secondhand smoke. Uh, but one of the things I do to decrease the stigma of going right into a, a social history and say, do you smoke, you know, is often I'll do the family history first. And then I'll ask the patient, um, did you get a, were you exposed to secondhand smoke when you your child? Often, um, particularly, you know, 40, 50 years ago, or my patients are adults, um, a lot of times parents or guardians or people in their home smoked. And that's often, you know, I will get a yes response because we know that uh, uh, parents who smoke, uh, the likelihood of a child smoking is much higher. So secondhand smoke is important. It's hard to quantify but I do have it in my notes and I actually follow um, the patients in our lung cancer program that also had exposures to that, particularly to, in our patients, as we know that um, anyone with lungs can get lung cancer, it's just not those who smoke. 
20% or a little bit more than 20% of the lung cancer population are in patients that do not smoke. Often mm -hmm. this is due to a mutation, but often I, uh, in all of these patients, I will also look at their secondhand uh, smoke exposures. Great. Well, great. Does anyone else have any other questions? I think I got all of the questions in the chat. Um, anyone else have any comments, questions for Mary and Marisol? I guess one more little bonus. This is it's on topic. Uh, I got this little thing that may help your smoking cessation patients. It's called a shift and it kind of Ah, so you put it in your mouth and it activates the parasympathetic nervous system because it controls your exhale. So it helps to decrease anxiety like people think smoking does. So this is available online. It's called the shift. It's based on like ancient monk cultures. So and uh and even people who are vaping i have a friend who vapes and she got one of these to replace the behavior I the hand that. mouth Great idea. So, so, well thank you everyone for staying on i know we ran a little over but this is such an engaging discussion and so interesting thank you so much mary and marisol for speaking and wrapping up our year so hopefully i will be putting together next year's docket of speakers and sending out an email soon um, with next year's projected invites. Thank right. you. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Bye-bye.